One more time, the hashtag, like we mentioned, Transform Africa 2015. We'd love to hear your thoughts on the conference, your um, ideas around what is being talked about on stage. What we're going to next is the opening plenary of Transform Africa 2015. This is on unlocking Africa's smart and sustainable economies. I will introduce what I like to call a power panel in just a bit, but before that, let me set the stage for you because over the past few decades, Africa has made notable strides in economic development with the digital revolution substantially redefining trade and continuing to be a catalyst for this economic growth. This session, we hope, will explore Africa's growth potential as a digitally driven economy as Africa is increasingly experiencing a growing wave of innovation and governments are placing internet-driven growth firmly on the development agendas, these panelists will address friction factors, digital infrastructure, shortage of capital and skilled labor, payment systems and data security, volumes of localized content that are preventing economies from realizing the internet's full benefits. And this session is also going to further explore policy interventions, partnerships and opportunities that could unleash Africa's economic growth. I will chair this panel and I'm honored to have joining me on stage today. Please welcome them as they come in one by one. First, we have Cynthia Gordon, Executive Vice President of the Millicom Group. Please give her a big round of applause. We also have on joining us on this panel, Tariq Alatovich, principal at McKinsey and Company. Also with us is Professor Romain Morenzi, Director General of the World Academy of Sciences. On this panel as well, Frederick Jedling, President and CEO of Ericsson Sub-Saharan Africa. And last but no mean, by no means least, he's a, a favorite um, minister of so many of you, you're all familiar with him, Honorable Jean Philvain Sengimana, Minister of Youth and ICT in the Republic of Rwanda. Okay, so I'm going to start off. We're just going to move around. If um, everybody just look at uh, how everybody's sitting for a moment. Sure. Yes, please. Okay. okay. Oh. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you all for so much for being on this panel. We look forward to hearing your insights over the next few minutes about um, especially digitally driven Africa and our main topic unlocking Africa's smart and sustainable economies. And I wanted to start off with um, our host because uh, Honorable JP, as a lot of people in the ICT industry call him in Africa and beyond, is kind of a rock star minister, if you think about it. He's very switched on, he knows what's happening. He's uh, uh, behind the Transform Africa Summit and the Smart Africa Initiative. And I want to kind of hear your opening remarks. Everybody will have three minutes to give us their opening remarks on this subject. And I wanted to start with you as our host. Thank you. Um I'm not a rock star. <laughs> now he but denies it. I'm, I'm connected for sure. Um, you know, I think I was tempted to sort of uh, talk again through um, what is smart Africa, but uh, I thank my prime minister because he really went into pillar by pillar, and by now I think everyone, even those who were not uh, in the first edition of Transform Africa, I think they understand what smart Africa is all about. So let me change my line of thought and share probably three things that I believe are important. Um, I don't think many people spend time to understand what do we really mean by smart. So let me start from there. First thing I think being smart is being connected. And I'm talking about your device, I'm talking about your car, I'm talking about your office and even your cow or whatever you, you, you have. Being connected is important, and that's why um, Smart Africa has decided to make access to broadband as one of the top priorities. And I believe that it is the foundation on which we are building all these new, exciting, innovative developments. Secondly, being smart is about sharing. Many people don't realize that. The economy of... Uh, ownership of assets is gone. We have entered into a new era of sharing. It's 
sharing of everything, probably except one, one thing. <laughs> so you can share your, your gadget. That's called bring your own device. So you use, I use this phone for my personal use, for government use. You share a ride. Your car, when you, you are dropped off at the office, it can go out uh, in the city and start dropping out people from point A to point B. A big business today uh, around that is called Uber. You can share your house, your bedroom. I'm, I'm getting close to that one thing. <laughs> uh, that is called Airbnb. Now, think about it. Sharing... Um, there are businesses today that are being created. Within one to two years, they get the reach the one billion mark. It used to take minimum 20 years for the most successful companies to build out to one billion dollar mark. But guys, young people today, they are building such businesses in just one year because of that change of paradigm. So I think it is important to understand that um, uh, sharing is, uh, is part of the new uh, equation. So, the third thing about being smart is measuring. And, and you don't start by measuring things. You start by measuring yourself, your health, your safety. You measure what you, wh where you go. I think Frederick will talk about and how you, how you move. All that is measured. You measured what you own, especially, you know, your money, your wallet. And all that measurements will lead, and, and, and it connects to the big data that we all know about, and, you know, Internet of Things, really measuring everything. So you cannot be smart if you don't measure. And when you measure, then you need the infrastructure for, for doing those measurements. You need uh, networks, you need data center, you need analytics, you need the business intelligence to be able to make sense of what you've measured. So... If I recap, measuring, sharing, connecting, that's what being smart is all about. That's what being smart is all about. Thank you so much, Honorable JP. And I wanted to go to Cynthia Gordon because uh, just to talk a bit more about the digital lifestyle, she, he talked about the shared economy, which is kind of big globally right now. I don't know what your perspective of that, on that is in Africa. Great. So maybe to start with a little bit of introduction on Millicom and Tigo. So through our brand Tigo, we are present in 13 countries in Latin America and Africa with circa 7 billion US revenue. In Africa, we operate in six countries. So Rwanda, obviously, Tanzania, DRC, Chad, Ghana, and Senegal. And across those countries, we have about 28 million customers that we offer uh, communication services to. Of those 28 million customers, currently only about 6 million of them access to the, the internet. And we think that we have a great responsibility to really close that gap and make sure everyone has the chance. And to enable that, we've successfully rolled out 2G, 3G, and 4G in a number of our markets. And our approach is very much based on the digital lifestyle and our belief that young Africans demand and deserve the opportunity to fulfill their potential. And I don't talk about hope and wish, I talk about very strong words in terms of deserve and demand. And we believe very strongly that the, the biggest enabler to them fulfilling their potential is access to the internet. So growth for us will come from Africa having a population of youth who are strongly connected, creative, and educated, a generation of what we call digital citizens. And for us, it all starts with access and broadband access to the internet. And it's very inspiring to hear the ITU, the Prime Minister, talk about that very strongly. And I'd like to bring it home to a really human case study. And I think all of us look for inspiration in our daily lives and a very small story that has very profound impact on me is uh, when I went into one of our stores, I met a father who would brought his son into our store to buy their first smartphone. And he did that because he realized the profound impact that would have on his son's life's chances. 
And I think we all, as parents, the biggest gift that we can give our children is the opportunity for them to fulfill their potential. So I'm very proud if we can help that to happen across Africa. All right. And I want to link that to the digital infrastructure required to have that kind of thing, that father buying a smartphone for his um, son. There needs to be an infrastructure to support that lifestyle they need. And um, I remember seeing um, Frederick Jettling, the president and CEO of uh, Ericsson Sub-Saharan Africa at Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and you're talking about all these exciting things you're doing in Africa, and this falls right in that alley. No, sure, and, and first of all, um, it's, it's great to be here, and uh, we're very proud to serve a lot of the uh, current operators here in the market with uh, a lot of that digital uh, technology they're talking about. And uh, we're also very proud to cooperate with the Rwandan government on uh, what is called Smart Rwanda then, and how we can uh, advise and uh, implement and integrate new solutions for the government. Uh, I think uh, w when it comes to Africa, uh, you know, we've seen a, a sort of voice revolution over the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, and we've seen up to about 600 million subscriptions of voice and uh, probably around the five, six million mark here in Rwanda. Uh, what we're seeing is a very accelerated deployment of digital or mobile broadband technologies. And uh, if you look at current levels, these are just big numbers, but uh, we might be around 70 million mobile broadband subscription across Africa today. And that is likely to grow to 700 million. And that is probably the biggest uh, growth rate, or it is the biggest growth rate that we can see in any part of our regions, and that's what makes uh, Africa so exciting. Uh, I think um, uh, there are a couple of components, if I may, just to, be, to make sure that happens. Technology is, after all, and I hate to say that, but it is only technology, and it will evolve over time. Uh, and I think uh, what we're seeing with this forum, and uh, Rwanda in particular, we're seeing a very and, and the basic importance of the collaboration between the parties here, because to make this uh, sort of fly and to make to reap the benefits, the well-documented GDP growth benefits, employment benefits of ICT, uh, we need to collaborate. And I think this is a great forum for that. I think um, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we need to have regulators and uh, governments providing broadband plans, like we're discussing today. We need to harmonize spectrum plans. Uh, operators and ourselves need to understand that technology can be deployed in uh, this type of market. So, uh, and I think these are great forums for, for establishing this. And um, the way we see it, it's uh, mobility is actually one component of this. Um, uh, the other parts are the cloud. We need to have a, a high, fast access, low cost storage solution which can be established by the cloud. Uh, and then the broadband aspect. When you get these three in combination, you get a very powerful platform. And uh, the minister was talking about sharing. It enables sharing economies, enables people to share, uh, and it enables uh, utilization economy beyond what we've seen before. And it actually brings the power away from, sad to say, but maybe innovation companies like Ericsson into the hands of people, because they have the platform mobility crowd and broadband. Uh, so a lot of things are happening at the same time, but I think it's not only the digital platforms, it's also the way we create environments around that to facilitate the growth around that. Um, we are showcasing today in Rwanda uh, a couple of fruits of the cooperation with the, with the minister, and that is regarding uh, mobile interconnection switch, bringing down the cost, production cost of financial services to the point where more people can acquire it. Uh, secondly, we talk about intelligent transport, and if you, if you go with one of these blue buses out here, uh, they are actually connected and monitored in an intelligent transport system, and they uh, combine them with the cashless society. And the third thing we're doing it is smart grids, where we look at how to deploy uh, various uh, solutions for effective utilization of energy. So these are just the thing, the digital network is just the basics. Okay. All right, uh, Professor uh, Romain, uh, Murenzi, as you give your opening remarks, I wonder if you still want to talk a little about the skills required to make all of this work. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank RDB for inviting me to, to join this, uh, this conference. Uh, the World Academy of Science operates in 92 countries, and we, are, we have offices in five regions. And the aim of the Academy is to build science excellence in the developing world. As it relates to Africa, there are several challenges uh, one can mention. Every year, the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, produces information society, the measure of information society, as we want, we talk about smart 
Africa, we would like to move into information economy, information society. And of the, the 30 countries that are at the bottom, all of them are from sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this is a major challenge. If you look up in terms of uh, publications worldwide, Africa has only 2% of the global publications, including information communication technologies. So if we talk about smart, it is very important to address that, that particular issue. And of the 2% publication that come out, 75% of that come from South Africa and Egypt. Oh dear. So leaving, leaving the other part of the continent being really at the very basic. So, so this becomes a major challenge as we are entering into this ICT and information communication. So having a digital infrastructure is very important, but having people who knows how to program is very important. So how do you talk about that? So what is the, what are we doing for, from primary education to secondary education to higher education? What kind of ICT in primary education? Are we really considering that giving the devices to our children, they say like one up a child, as very, very central? Are we teaching them how to program? How about secondary school? These are going to be the, 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 the workforce okay. of the 2025, 2030, as we're talking about this uh, 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 sustainable development. So I'm going to end by showing you how bad it is. Throughout the developing world, and in particular on the continent, only 10%, between 10% and 20% of the teachers at the university have a PhD degree. This means that somebody may be teaching you programming at the university, but he has probably a bachelor's degree and a master's. He doesn't have a PhD. And this had a huge impact right. going down the stream, being teachers in secondary school, teachers in primary school. So, 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 so the issue of a training PhD at the continental level is a major, major issue, and in particular in, in computing. So that, that I consider. So we cannot reach smart Africa if we don't have the right training and the right teachers at higher education. All right. I want to come back to you a little later on that because it's just fascinating when you talk about it, that only 2% of publishing is coming from Africa, and even within that, the majority from South Africa and Egypt. But I wonder, the McKinsey guy, um, Tarek, if this has an element of capital or uh, private-public um, partnerships that can help kind of bridge that gap. Yeah. So I'll talk about that just in a second. Right. Uh, but let me just start with just some opening remarks. So sure. first of all, very honored uh, to be in front of this group. I think this is really a group of people uh, who are driving the digital transformation today, the digital tsunami, uh, as we like to call it. You know, going back to the point Cynthia made about how digital is transforming, you know, individual lives, maybe my own personal story. And you know, if it wasn't for digital, I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, so about 15 years ago, in the early days of internet, uh, I actually started chatting online with my future wife-to-be. Uh, and, you know, we actually met online 15 years ago. Uh, I was in US at the time, she was in Cape Town. You know, we got to know each other, we married, uh, and I fell in love with her and I fell in love with the continent. So, you know, I think just the potential of digital transformation on the continent is huge. Um, for us as McKinsey, and we are a strategic consultancy, digital is the topic that we serve our clients on today. It's, you know, it's a topic for every board, for every exco, for every uh, government. Uh, it's just, it, it changes everything. Um, so what we have done, actually a couple of years back, we have published a big report, it's called Lions Go Digital. Um, and we studied really just what's the transformative potential of internet on the continent. Um, and you know, we found some great things and we also found that you know, lots of uh, potential can be unlocked. Maybe just one thing to, to illustrate how quickly things are changing. When we published that report about two years ago, everything has changed by more than factor of two. So when we published the report, Africa used to have about 50 million Facebook subscribers. Today, it's 130 million plus. Uh, when we published the report, um, I think uh, smartphone penetration also used to be under, uh, I think it was 20, 30 million. It, it has exploded. I think we are approaching shipments of about 100 million of smart smartphones a year. 
Uh, and you know, over the next few years, we believe you know more than 50% of all the uh, of the smartphones of all the mobiles will be smartphones. So just the pace the pace of change is is, is tremendous. Um, so when we did this report, we studied 20 African countries, and you know, we asked our questions. You know, what are the key elements to get right so we can further unlock a potential internet? Uh, and we actually came up with five things. I think two or three we already discussed. Right. So definitely the ICT infrastructure, having a great uh, broadband, mobile broadband in place. Uh, and I think we can, all countries can actually learn a lot from Rwanda. You have experimented with some very innovative uh, models, public-private partnerships. Uh, second is the ICT skills base, which we discussed. Uh, and th th that's critical. So you know, how good is our math and science education? Uh, how many tertiary, ter tertiary degrees do we have? You know, is there a good linkage between industry and university in terms of producing skills that matter? So in digital world, you know, that's you know, your agile developers and your custom experience designers and your data scientists. It's really sort of changing, uh, changing the agenda that's being taught and how it's being taught. Uh, we didn't talk much about business environment, but ease of doing business is uh, key because there's a huge link between digital and entrepreneurship. You know, if you don't allow our companies to innovate rapidly, you know, we're not going to move as quickly uh, as we possibly could. And the last one is just access to uh, f um, financial capital, you know, growing angel investor communities, growing venture capital, you know, very systematically. Uh, and we have examples of countries that are experimenting with that. Uh, so, for example, uh, I think the Minister of ICT in Kenya couldn't join us uh, this morning, but he could talk about the partnership they are planning on, what they are calling Enterprise Kenya, which is basically public-private partnership to really grow um, venture capital, to grow you know, um, technology labs, to, to accelerate innovation. Okay. I think at the beginning, you, he might have just, did you notice that? He, the, perhaps the living, breathing example that internet dating works. He met his wife, they've been together, what, 15 years now, so that's a good thing. And it goes back to the digital lifestyle you were talking about. 15 years before... 15 years and six kids later, it actually works. 15 so. years and six kids later, he yeah. says it's works, so that is a good thing. You, go. um, you might have noticed that the Prime Minister is still in the audience, which is um, amazing. Not, not many um, African leaders do this, and it's important that he's here to listen to these conversations. I'm going to take one other round of questions for the panel, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, if you will raise your hand at that time, we'll get a mic through to you, introduce yourself, and ask a short question. But I would just wonder, in the two years since Smart Africa was launched, um, Honorable JP, if there are any lessons, and Rwanda is a leader in ICT's adoption and how that is helping um, just avail services to the public, to citizens, but also get them, even leapfrog Europe, as the IT Secretary General was talking about. Are there any lessons in this process? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but allow me, moderator, to reflect uh, probably on, 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 two, on two positions of my predecessors. I think... Um, Professor Morenzi painted the position where Africa is today, and uh, I felt a bit depressed <laughs> because it's sort of a bad news that we are so far, uh, you know, behind, and taxi. it is true. But that's a bad news part of it. Mm. There is a good news part of it, and that's what Tariq said, the pace of change. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, six of the ten most growing, fastest growing economies of the world are in Africa. If you ask uh, Ericsson, what is their fastest, fastest growing market in the world? It is Africa. Where is the most excitement for innovation? It is in Africa. So I think there are two sides that we always need to keep in mind. Yes, we are coming from a very low base, but we need to keep that optimism very much alive. And that's why you are here. That's why we are here. All right. Yeah. So... Let me, let me address your question, which is, uh, are there any lessons? Right, from Smart Again, Africa. let me talk about uh, three things. One, the first lesson is leadership matters. We cannot accomplish anything of all of this very beautiful discussion we're having if we don't have the right leadership in place. At least that's the testimony that Rwanda can share. Over the last 20 years, when Rwanda put in place the Vision 2020, uh, you all remember coming from a very painful past and deciding to make ICT as one of the key ingredients in remodeling society, in rebuilding the society, in ushering the, the country into an information age that was not there at that time, remember, from just an agrarian economy uh, and very rapidly changing from an agriculture-based economy to a, a knowledge-based economy. That is what leadership is all about. 
And that's why we said in Smart Africa that policy becomes the most important uh, uh, foundation. Um, secondly, it's education. No question about it. And uh, Professor Morenzi talk, uh, talked about it. I'll not emphasize it. Educate, invest in education, count the results later. And the third is investment. It's not the private sector. Again, Frederick talked about the PPPs. But um, I, I want to, 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 to touch on the fact that the private sector's business is, is making money. The government business is effective change, is raising people's uh, uh, standard, standard of living. And we have to find a point of meeting. And by just putting in place the right environment for doing business in Africa, will we able to attract the required investment to transform this very huge potential that we see into results for our people. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I don't mean to pit you against your predecessor, but uh, I just wanted to flesh out for Professor um, Renzi to flesh out a little about the lack of publishing coming from Africa and how to fix that. Like, how, how do we move from here to make sure our voice is being heard there, but also that people are reading us? Uh, uh, I had an opportunity to, to lead, uh, to, to chair the high-level panel on technology bank for the, for the least developing countries. And I, we just delivered the report to the Secretary General and need that we consider that uh, uh, broadband is, is very is essential. Mm -hmm. uh, access to, to publications. If you are somewhere in, uh, in Nepal or you're in Benin or even Burundi and Rwanda, if you don't have access to connectivity, you cannot have access to other publications. So that access to, to publication is very, very important. And that was one, a major part of, of, of the report. And um, so I agree with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the, uh, the Honorable Minister that there is a part that is a reality of the lack of uh, human resources and skilled labor, but there are things that are being done with leadership to change that. It's very important. But it's always important in these situations where people are here stakeholder to bring to the attention of the challenges that we are having and these challenges, having like a matrix saying these are the challenges and how to meet these challenges in terms of the skills in particular. Because the skills take time. Right. It takes time and, and that is what sometimes worries me. It takes time. And that the, the time it takes to, to, to train somebody and to turn it into, into a, a workforce, that's something we have to, to pay attention as okay. we are talking about, about uh, about smart, smart is it important Africa? to start them young? Like Rwanda is doing handing um, devices to primary school kids because then they grow up already in this kind of ecosystem. That's, that's the key point. That that's very, very central. You see, uh, if you take five to ten years ago, it couldn't have been possible to dream even about that. Right. Because we didn't have the connectivity. In the past, you needed to have a wire to the computer to be able to have access to the internet. Now you don't need that. Yes. You, just need, you just need the fiber optic at the door of the, the school, and then you can use the Wi-Fi. So this means that there is no reason that any school could not have access to broadband. And things have changed dramatically now. The cost of the devices are going down. This means it is possible to put in the hand of the children broadband. But not only that, it is possible to put in the hands, in, in the homes, Broadband, because you, you don't need a desktop anymore. So, so we will be able actually to move forward without having access to the, the desktop, but having access to the uh, mobile devices that gives you broadband. And that will change dramatically into accessing to, to information, into being able to be able access to education, the MOOC, the massive online open courses. This means you can sit here in Kigali and have a master's degree online, even a PhD online. You don't need to move to the US, even to China, to get a degree. So these this, this things are going to be possible. Right. So smart African transform Africa should be also be able to, to, to do that, to, to move into this digital era. Broadband is very, very central. Okay, Tarek, you wanted to jump in here. Um, I had a couple of uh, additions in, to the remarks the Honorable Minister JP made. 
Uh, so the first one on the importance of national ICT strategy. I think that's key. Now, actually most countries will have some sort of ICT strategy, e-strategy. Uh, I don't know many countries that don't have one. What makes a difference though is, you know, is that strategy focused? Because the scope of digital is so broad. So, you know, having a really clear thinking about what are the priorities, what can be funded, uh, how do we make sure it's not overly siloed across many different departments, you know, that's key. Uh, and and uh, the, the governments that were able to really crystallize that, you know, have made a huge progress. So I think that's a first comment. Second one on the role of the private sector. So when we did the Lions Go Digital Report, one thing that we studied is what made, what made up internet GDP in Africa and how was it different from develop, developed economies. Uh, one big difference, we found most of the internet GDP in Africa, with exception of maybe Morocco and South Africa to extent, was driven by private consumption. There was actually very little private investment, uh, little public expenditure compared to, certainly compared to developed markets, but even compared to other uh, emerging countries, and little, um, uh, little export-driven activity. So if you're gonna take the internet, uh, opportunities on internet, uh, you know, to the next level, it needs to move beyond just private consumption, you know, to really encourage more private investment, putting even more money uh, as governments into it and, you know, encouraging uh, export-driven growth. Okay. Cynthia, go ahead. Maybe to jump in, this point about having a clear strategy, and that's really my request to all the governments, that they set out a very clear broadband strategy so people, like, companies like ourselves, know how we can contribute. And I'd like to give you some best practice examples and maybe some more challenging examples as well. And before I go there, just to mention the ITU, has, together with the GSMA, has done some great work in really supporting governments in developing that broadband strategy. And you can see with the Rwanda government is represented on the ITU Broadband Commission. And I, I think you can see the coherence and focus of that strategy in, in practice. And I'll give you one example. Uh, six years ago, the government in Rwanda invested in cable and metro fiber cable, 4, 000, nearly 4,000 kilometers across this country. That was a very forward-thinking investment to make. I'll give you another example, uh, so, and something I can't explain and I don't understand. In some of the countries across Africa, we see that the government is charging up to 40% sales tax on devices. I do not understand how those practices support development of broadband in their country. So I, th I think we need to look clear, carefully at what are the best practice and the worst practices examples and challenge those worst practices very clearly as an industry. All right, 40% sales tax, that preaches because it makes the cost of the device very prohibitive. Exactly. All right. I, I want, before I, I go to Frederick, I wanted to ask you about the importance. He was talking about the private sector and the importance of uh, having that in, in, in the ecosystem. And um, do you want to talk a little about private sector support for innovation, for instance? You announced the Think project, the um, technology hub in Kigali, but there's been talk now about it scaling down or even getting shut completely. So, how important is that private sector involvement in all of this we've been talking about? Cynthia? I, th I think it's, it's critical. Um, clearly, we need to invest. I mean, we've invested nearly $400 million in, in, in building out our network, IT systems in Randa, and we're investing in the other markets. Um, but we need to have, uh, we are a business, we need to make profits, and we need to have a regulatory framework, a business environment that is stable and transparent. Because if you're investing in networks, you're not investing for five, eight years. You're investing for 10 to 20 years. So we need to know that over that time frame, we're going to have supportive government policies. We're going to have a, a, an ecosystem that helps us. So I, I think investment has to come from the operators. And I, I would challenge particularly some of the other players in the ecosystem about the reality of how much they are investing. If we look at some of the OTT providers, I think there's some great PR, but I really challenge what the reality of some of those investments are. Okay, before I go to Professor Morenzi, I want to bring in Frederick real quick. I'm sure there are some friction factors that you experience doing business across the continent and maybe some interventions you think could ease that out. No, sure, and I, and I think first of all, uh, to bring this on a, on a very positive side, I think we are one of the few industries that does not at all have a demand problem, rather the opposite. 
uh, we, are, we are looking at an unsaturated demand for whatever comes with mobile broadband. And to, to be honest, there are very few industries uh, that, that has that uh, sort of a situation. So we should, be, we should be very thrilled about that. But I would say probably that we might have more of a business model problem rather than a demand problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is good because that is with everybody's control that is sort of sitting in this panel. Because again, it comes back to the role of the various players. And I think when it comes to investments, and when I look at our investments that we do in the market, they will come because of the unsaturated demand from the consumer and from businesses and industry side. However, of course, there is a role in, uh, and I think Cynthia was speaking about that, on regulators, government to provide a predictability, uh, to align with global standards when it comes to spectrum allocation, when it comes to mobile broadband plan. Uh, there's a role for me, for sure, to try to figure out how to make a $2 ARPU customer uh, get a great mobile broadband connection, and not only from a price point, but also from a, from a, from a business model point and, and, and how to work in the ecosystem. So, uh, and of course, operators need to figure out together ways of uh, penetrating beyond the, uh, the current 25, 30% that wideband is covered in Africa today. So I think there's a role for everybody, but the positive point is that uh, data growth is growing 20 times over the next uh, three, four years. And it's uh, up to us to fix a business that can take care of that. Okay. All right, Professor Morenzi, before we open up to the audience. Yes, uh, <clears throat> the innovation is very central. But and again, innovation is built. Uh, and education is very central. Uh, let's uh, take an example for Rwanda here. If you look at the, the telecom companies, what are they doing to work with the university to organize competition, just for programming, <laughs> basic. These kids who enter there, they are 20, 21, 19. How do they help them to do that? If you can organize a competition right. through the university system, even sometime at the secondary school level, you can bring up things that we have never seen before. Because of the culture of this country, it could be in another country, you can bring some new things. And that is very, very central. And then the, the output of the educational system here, those who are going to finish IT, are going to be working in the system. How does the, the telecom company and the other private sector, how do they work with, with the departments? How do they invest in, in, into the, the, the laboratories? Do they do that? Okay. So that is very, very central. And, and that's, you see, we talk about science, technology, and innovation. And innovation is not... It's not about discovering new things. It's sometimes it's about adapting. And, and that's the children, that the kids that we have in school, they can do that. But investment is very, very central, but also equipment and infrastructure and laboratory are very, very important. Okay. But I think the local, the local businesses and private sector, they have enough money to be able to help the educational system. What you mentioned is important. That's why I was trying to get a commitment earlier from Cynthia about uh, Millicom Group. Um, and Tigo did launch Think, and I didn't hear a commitment exactly about the future of that. Mm. So, so I think it's very much we are committed to Africa. We are investing, and we are positive about the opportunity in the market. But I, I think it's also about smart investment. Right. And I think you can see innovation not only in the technology and at the customer level, but also innovation in the, be the business model. And I'm really pleased that the government here has encouraged the industry to share network. And that's quite a technical thing, uh, but in this country we have 60% of our sites co-located. What in practice does that mean? That means that every dollar we spend in this market goes further in terms of a wider coverage, wider network. So my challenge to governments around Africa is help and bring together all operators so network sharing can be common practice. It's one of the most powerful levers that we have as an industry to bring broadband to the next billion. Okay. And sometimes for competitive reasons, some operators are never very keen to share the masks, to share the infrastructure. I think all, so all operators are very keen to share. I think sometimes the regulatory framework, okay. the, the, the policies don't encourage that. And I think the government can be very helpful in pulling those operators' community together. Okay. 
I would like to open up uh, the questions now to the audience. Um, there's one lady there already, which is awesome. Please get a mic through to her. When you do get a mic, please introduce yourself and your organization and ask a quick question. And then we'll get a few more. Do you want to take a couple and then we'll answer them together instead of one each? Okay. Please get a mic to this lady over here. If you do get a microphone, please stand so everybody can see you. And also smile, give you a good side because you're on television. <laughs> yes, please, please stand. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Nenna. I always to introduce myself as Nenna from the internet. I'm the Africa Regional Coordinator for the World Wide Web Foundation. I have one quick question to the person who denied that he's a star, but he's really a global star, not just an African star. Preach, yes. Mr. Minister, um, earlier this week, we found an official communique from the presidency of an African country in which the president happily declares that he's not on any social media, where he threatens anyone who uses his personality of criminal justice. I want to push more into the policy leadership that you spoke about. And maybe not just talk about ICT, but digital inclusion. What are the secrets of Rwanda? Can you give us three? What are the leadership policy secrets of Rwanda for digital inclusion? Thank you. Thank you very much. And that um, may be contrasted as we get a mic to the next person with uh, President Kagame who personally tweets. And you can obviously see the minister is actually on his phone right now. Maybe he's responding to some tweets while we're out there. <laughs> um, my name is Mohammed Sharif, and I'm representing Sierra Leone Cable Limited in, in Freetown. Um, it's just a comment on the discussions that have been going on. I think the problem with developing the digital landscape in Africa can be the fact that there are no clear delineations in terms of who is responsible for what. We need to define clear roles for government and clear roles for the private sector. And if we do that, then we will achieve the goals that we are all aiming at. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. My name is uh, Henrik Mogard. I'm representing uh, Blue Town, which is also sponsoring this uh, great event. So uh, I'm really happy to hear about uh, this uh, tagline line about connecting the next billion. That is basically also what we want to do with our innovative uh, solution for uh, connecting rural areas. I would very much also encourage all the uh, the, 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 uh, the leaders and presidents of uh, the, the uh, America, uh, excuse me, African countries to work with us and also you in the panel to, to find a business model for this because right now we actually have an innovative solution which is very low cost okay. to actually spread uh, broadband to uh, areas where you don't even have uh, power and electricity. All right. the, the issue is basically the cost. And how can we find uh, a solution to actually combine the backhaul to a business case uh, to the to the local uh, local community? That was that would be something I would like to discuss. Further. The cost of connectivity to the to the next billion. All right, thank you. Thank you. Listen, so if you're anywhere else on the on the aisle, we have mics kind of on the aisle. So if you can find one and get to it real quick, yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Bradley Shaw here from Ubongo. Uh, we currently have an educational TV show on air in Rwanda on a Saturday morning on RBT. Oh, sorry, RBC. The question I have is, Honorable Minister, you mentioned that there were devices being given out in Rwanda uh, to school children. What is happening on the investment side to provide content to engage with on those devices? Okay, and I think I'll take one last question, uh, hopefully from this. My yes, okay, you are proactive, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Jean-Leon Uragena, uh, representing Okungo MC Limited. I, I would like to ask a question to 
uh, Honorable Professor Romain Murenzi. Uh, he talked about uh, the two percent of the world publication coming from Africa, just two percent. So I would like to ask, according to their publications, uh, what is the issue? Why is it just two percent? Is it just because of uh, the lack of uh, uh, internet connectivity in Africa, the lack of the capacity of publication, or is just any uh, question? Okay. Uh, the, the second thing, which is also the, uh, the last one, I'd like to ask about the 10%, 20% of uh, our university teachers only having the PhDs. Uh, is it related to the brain drain, or is that uh, because Africans uh, have the less PhDs on the global uh, level? Thank you. Okay, let's start with the Honorable Sengimana at um, African Leadership Secrets, um, a president that's not on social media and also content for the devices you're handing out to kids. Thank you so much. Uh, Nena, first of all, let me say I'd, um, I haven't come across that statement, so whatever I say, it's not related, it's not personal. Um, I think there are no secrets, in fact, if you look at it. Um, but there is probably a recipe. So the recipe, the three things that you are uh, looking for, uh, there are so many, but let me, let me reflect on three. One is about being people-centered. It's about being inclusive. Because we are conscious in this room, we have only probably 2.5 thousand people, but there are thousands there out uh, following us online. So if you not leverage this social media, it's a tremendous opportunity that any leader who cares really about being open and inclusive should leverage. Am I saying that there are no risks? the risk of an account being hacked and people posting inappropriate material in your name, that risk is there. But we have to wear the risk and the benefits. So I think benefits so far outweigh the risks that it becomes very compelling for a leader who is, uh, uh, self, uh, who, who is um, people-centered, who is inclusive uh, to tap into those opportunities. So I think that's, that's the first part of that recipe. The second part of the recipe comes with a balance between strategy and execution, policy and execution. We talked about policy, but what about implementation? So I think one of the ingredients in Rwanda's leadership that made things happen is that willingness to take the risk to move from words to actions, to walk the talk. We all know that uh, Sun Tzu saying that uh, strategy without tactics is the longest route to victory. But tactics without strategy is a big noise before defeat. So we have a both strategy and tactics, and um, President Kagame really pushes all of us in Rwanda at least to really put action behind uh, uh, the words. Okay. Um, you want a third one? There's a gentleman from Ubongo who asked about the content for the devices you're handing out to the children. Does anybody have a microphone, a moving microphone? I want to put on the spot my colleague, Minister of Education, who is sitting right in front of front. me. Because Let's get a microphone here at the bread and please. butter. I, want, I don't want to steal it. He doesn't want to steal the Minister of Education's thunder. Minister of Education is sitting right there. Microphone, please. A, a microphone right here, please. There's a gentleman coming up. Okay. Uh, I really agree with um, the gentleman from RBA that um, of the past we put a lot of efforts into the distributing the devices, but uh, those devices cannot become um, a ready tool for enhancing education, teaching and assessment unless something is done. Now, the government of Rwanda and the Minister of Education um, for that cause, it has throat thought seriously about how to roll the content within those devices. And to start with, we have developed an ICT in education policy together with its implementation plan, which is going to take the education to the next level in the next five years, where IT is going to play a predominant role in terms of teaching and leading and assessment. And the part of the key component, one of the key components within the policy and its implementation plan, it is development of the digital content. And here in the room, I know that we have more than three companies 
where we have started serious engaging into the discussion on how we can digitize a brand new curriculum which we published of recently. We shifted from a knowledge-based curriculum to the competence-based curriculum, and it's going to be implemented in all primary, secondary, and even tertiary education, beginning with the, the next academic year. Okay. So the company which we are in a conversation right now, they are trying to help to come up with a solution in terms of digitizing that curriculum. So we are figuring out what type of the curriculum should it be just having the traditional books into the electronic form? Definitely no. Should it be much more interactive? Perhaps yes. So we are still defining key features which we need to embed into the kind of the content which we want to put into those devices. And very soon when we start with the massive distribution of those devices, definitely they will go with the right digital content which is going to help kids in schools to enhance their way of running and teaching assessment. Thank you. All right, many thanks the Education Minister for Rwanda. Cynthia, you want to go ahead? Can I just pick up on... I just wanted to pick up on this point about local content because I think it's critical and definitely we all need to do a lot more about it. And I'll give you one practical example. We launched Facebook in Tanzania in Swahili. And to do that, we sent some of our Swahili-speaking team members over to Silicon Valley to work with Facebook to design all of that. That, to me, says something about the types of companies we need, that we need to live and work and operate in the environments in which we have customers. So, you know, the Facebooks of the world need to have Swahili-speaking team members. Right. So, you know, that's my challenge to all of us, and undoubtedly we need to do more, and I challenge other people to do more. Okay, um, for the rest of the panel, the question is about connecting the next billion and just how expensive it is. Um, we were talking earlier about broadband, and the gentleman talked about it's really expensive. Um, and for Professor Murenzi about um, publishing and whether there's so little coming from Africa, I don't know if you want to handle that first, or um, Frederick. Any of the questions that came up from the panel that you want to handle? No, I, I can comment maybe on the connection on the next uh, billion, or yes. actually, by a calculation, it's probably going to be from three billion mobile broadband subscribers up to maybe 8 billion by 2020 worldwide. I think, I mean, we are well, we're ready to look at various different access technologies, but we should be aware that the, the line in from GSM up to uh, 3G into LTE has, has connected cost efficiently billions of people so far. And I think we should be aware of that. And probably the mobile techno technology, the way it is now, is the most inclusive and uh, uh, powerful technology that's been developed. So um, uh, whether it's backhaul improvements you're looking at, or whatever kind of things, we can look at that. But I think we are looking forward to supporting another, actually, 5 billion mobile broadband connections with the 3G, 4G standards that we're looking at now. What, what is important is that you need to, it's a scale business. You need to harmonize against spectrum. And we have, for once, now one technology. We used to have CDMA, we used to have GSM. Okay. Now we've got LTE, it means that, particularly from an affordability of the end user, they can now afford the device because the chipset, which is the most uh, expensive component, the production cost goes down, meaning they get more and more people. So technology distribution is one thing, but the amount of handsets and the related scale and production cost that facilitates the uptake, we think. Okay, um, and for the nerds in the room, 4G is just launching out LTE in parts of Africa, but I know Ericsson in other parts of the world is already doing 5G tests. Yeah. Any kind of um, timelines when that might be happening on the African continent? Well, I, I think maybe, maybe we should ask Cynthia that. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, it depends. I, I think, you know, the, this continent we believe to be realistic uh, when you look at affordability. We think that I draw 700 million mobile broadband subscriptions in a few years out in time. Probably 600 of those will be 3G or HSPA, okay. which facilitate 20, 30 megabit per second. So I think we should be a bit realistic to that. 2020 is roughly our timeline globally for that. And uh, it's, it's an evolution of the current 4G. Uh, no new hardware investments in there. It's a software upgrade over time. So it's a bit of a different scenario. Okay. Yeah. Professor, um, Professor Morenzi, then we'll come to you. I think that um, connecting the next billion or two will require smart. Uh, combination of fixed and, and mobile. That's very important uh, to make. At the same time, also, it is be, be very important. A and that the connectivity will, will, will happen. Things are happening. But we may not probably put the devices in the hand of the citizens. Mm -hmm. 
and that will require a price reduction dramatically to have uh, uh, smart devices, devices enabled to be able to have access to connectivity uh, to, to, to the internet. That will be very central. So if we look in the next five, 10 years, how much, how, what will be the device, the cost of the device, compared to the, the GDP per capita of the citizen to put the, the device? Somebody said that you cannot ride a bicycle you cannot learn how to ride a bicycle if you don't have a bicycle. So you need to have the device in your hands to be able to have access to the connectivity. And that will be, I think, very, very central. And the private sector will be very important, but I think government can do a lot in terms of uh, subsidizing the, 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 the devices. Okay. So not having a 40% sales tax helps before they talk about subsidies. Mm -hmm. All right, um, I mean, Tarek. May, maybe just to conclude on this discussion. So you know, if you're going to get to the next billion, we need a very close uh, you know, work between public and private sector. From public sector, you know, we need very clear regulation <clears throat> around access to the low frequency spectrum, uh, around shared infrastructure. If you don't have those, you just won't be able to hit those you know, cost points that you're talking yes. about, and some predictability. So you know, when um, operators are making investments, you know, they know they're actually going to pay off. OK, Professor Morenzi, real quick. The gentleman over there asked how to make sure that um, that publishing number and the, uh, Africans being in the bottom 30 can be improved. Mm -hmm. If you have any thoughts around that. Uh, if you allow me, I'll like to comment also the issue of, uh, of content. Yes. So in, uh, in, general, in primary school, you need to have the, at least to have the, the book in the hand of the child. So the school material is very central. That would be the, the thing. If it's a math book, a book of French, a book of English, I don't know, book of science. So let's say probably five, six books. But each book may cost $20. But if you have one million children, for a country, is a lot. Yeah. But if you put a, a device in the hand of the child, that device costs $100, you can put all the books that you want. Plus, you can put all the books for primary one, two, three, because you can keep the device for, for three, four, five years. But if you have one book for primary school and another book for secondary school, sorry, for, for primary one, two, three, four, five, you understand the cost goes up. This is why it has been very, very challenging, even for UNESCO, to be able to put books in the, the hand of the children because it's physical books. So, so, so the mobile devices, such as one laptop per child, is very, very central. And to be able to know, of, of course, the books to put in and, and, and so forth. Okay. That's very central. Coming back to the question of the gentleman, in the 2000, uh, from 2000 to 2015, after the, the Millennium Development Goals, investment was only in education, was only focused on primary education. The donors from the, the multilateral development banks to the regional development banks to the bilaterals, the donors, they all focus on primary education, education for all. Investment in higher education was very, very limited. So, so throughout the, the decade and a half, that became a major challenge. Plus, in the last 15 years or so, you could see that the only p way, p place you could go and do a PhD was in Europe with the United States. But a cost of a PhD is, for four years is around $200,000, $250,000. So, so that becomes a, a big barrier to be able to train teachers at the PhD level in higher education. But the good news is that uh, China, India, Brazil, Malaysia, South Africa, these, Turkey, uh, now have very good schools where you can, you can send people to go and study. But also, bro and also uh, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the, the people staying in Europe or, or the US diminishes dramatically. Because when they are in China, most likely they, they will come back. When they are in Brazil, most likely they, they, they come back. But also the cost for a PhD is divided probably by half. Okay. Going from 250,000 to 100,000, 80,000 in four years. That becomes more and more affordable to be able to do that. All right. Thank you so much. Let's take another round of questions. We've got, we've got about... Um, Marita, if you allow, yes, I want to comment on the question of connecting the next, uh, the the connect next billion, billion, billion. Because I think it's important. But I have a better challenge, a tougher challenge. Let's not think about connecting the next billion, because that's an easy one. 
if you look at the curve, where, how it's going, probably in the next two, three years, it's going to be connected, whether you do something or not. The market is already having the momentum okay. necessary to connect the next billion. But what about connecting the last billion? I think that's where our, our efforts and, and thinking should be. And I see three challenges. I see three challenges that constitute, you know, opportunities always ca come uh, disguised as challenges. So the first challenge is, um, is energy. You know, if you look across the continent, uh, less than 40% access to electricity in homes, it's a big challenge to connecting these people. Mm. It's almost a miracle that we can get to levels of, connecti of, of, uh, of penetration in mobile devices of about, you know, 70, 80% while homes are only connected 20, 30%. But the biggest opportunity is renewable energy, solar power, micro, mini grids, off-grid solutions. And I know in this audience there are so many investors in those solutions. So the message here is any investor into energy is my favorite investor into ICT. <laughs> the second challenge is the challenge of digital literacy. We talk about whether kids should have digital books or print books, um, but to be able to drive a market, you need the demand. So the markets of telecommunications have been so much driven by supply. We need the demand. To activate the demand, you need to create that um, digital literacy, which will create the ability to consume the content that is out there, the demand for the devices. So again, the good news is there are so many people out there who who are focused on creating that uh, uh, digital literacy. Mm -hmm. Finally, let me talk about, uh, talk about the opportunity that Africa has, that no other continent has, which is the youthful population, and, and talking about this uh, being in charge of both youth and ICT. So we've got in Rwanda, for instance, more than al almost 80% uh, of our population is under the age of uh, 35. The median age in Africa is between 18 and 19. And those are the guys sitting behind there, you know, waiting to hear what is it that these old people are saying that we can transform into opportunity for ourselves. And I'm looking at Dr. Ture here, who famously declared that every other resource is not evenly distributed except for the human brains and ingenuity. So I think let's leverage on that and turn all these challenges into opportunities. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thank you, Mana. Can you I see why I call him... On building on your point about the last billion connected to the internet. Mm -hmm. I actually think the last billion, the majority will be women. So, so I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I'm particularly in addressing the women in the audience because I think they represent about 25-30% um, of the audience today. Um, so I, I think women are the change agents in the family. And our challenge is to get more of them digitized. I'm really proud with the work the local team are doing on things like the Tigo Sugare product, which is about enabling mobile money, et cetera, specifically addressing women that we will do that. And I'm very proud to be on this panel today, but I'll be even prouder when the panel is all women. <laughs> that is something to aspire for for the next Transform Africa. Let us take another round of questions. We have just about 15 minutes. Um, there's a lady here. If you, if, you, if you can just rise and get to a mic, that might be easier than trying to get the mics to you. They are in every aisle. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Antoinette Dodo. I present SAS Institute. Um, I hear a lot of talk about education. Um, it seems to be a very key initiative to try and promote um, the digital transformation. I'm happy that the Minister of education is here. I'm wondering what are the initiatives that you have started to introduce STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics into all levels of education. This will, I think, propel the transformation that we're looking for if we have students who come in contact with science, technology, yep engineering and mathematics okay. from a really young age and the resources that we need and the skills to continue this transformation and innovation. All right, 
the initiatives around STEM. There's, yes, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Mireille Carrera, and I'm a managing director of uh, Cora Associates, which is a company based in Dubai. So our area of speciality is coaching and uh, consulting. So we basically do personal development, organizational development, uh, focusing on uh, business development. Now, my question is to Minister Sengimana and Professor Murenzi. The question is around what are we doing for um, coaching and mentoring. Innovation is about ideas. It's, about, it's an inside job. It starts within you. It starts with an idea. It's about encouraging someone to believe that what you think about, what you dream about, can actually become a business. It can be the next Facebook, the next uh, Uber, uh, Airbnb, you name it. Okay. So my question is about what is the um, Ministry of Youth and ICT and the Academy also doing to promote um, coaching and mentoring, linking right. those who have got creative ideas with those that have got the business acumen. Okay, thank you so much. Let's get a few more. Um, there's several here at the front, so if we could get a mic here, or you could go to a mic at the aisle. In the meantime, go ahead. Three ladies in a row. Wow, nice. Yes, you, go ahead. Um, good, uh, good, good morning, everybody. And um, uh, my question is, um, is linked to something that uh, the Honourable Minister said earlier. Um, I'm Tracy McNeil. I work for a digital healthcare organisation that's been working very closely um, with the Minister and other government departments. Um, you, you talked earlier about uh, putting information into, uh, into the hands of everyone, and you used health as an example. And uh, we're very committed to doing that across Rwanda and, and East Africa. Um, I think one of the real challenges is when we're working in government partnership is actually working then with the private sector and the mobile phone operators who are all keen to improve health outcomes but are all looking for content on their phone. So my question is, um, in improving health outcomes in Rwanda, how do we work collaboratively both as private sector organisations um, and a government body to improve the health outcomes in Rwanda and to do that fast? Thank you. All right, thank you. Can I ask that we have shorter questions so we can get a few more, please? Yes, sir, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Karan Veer Singh and I'm from India. Uh, we are a country that's uh, almost 1.3 billion. We have uh, more than 900 million mobile subscribers. And one of the big challenges that we face today is that I'm seeing that people have forgotten how to communicate. People spend so much time with their own personal devices and it's pitiful because you see people going out to have a meal and they're supposedly there to interact with each other, but they have got their faces buried in their small screens. <laughs> so while we're going to talk about digital innovation, how do we prevent digital addiction? Okay. <laughs> uh, that, that is a very good point. Um, where's the mic? Somebody say, do you want to go somewhere amazing and stare at our phones together? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So... Uh, my name is Donnie Stein, I'm the GM for Intel in East Africa. One of the things that was mentioned earlier is the uh, implementation or the introduction of VAT on devices. And a lot of countries are doing that with a view of getting income for them as countries. However, if we look for instance at Kenya as an example in East Africa, 2013 they introduced VAT. As a result of the 16% VAT, the IDC reports have shown us that there's been between 30 to 40 percent year-on-year decline of the adoption of technology in the country. So the challenge is a number of the other East African community countries have done the same. Um, I'm glad to, for a discussion that I had with a minister a few months ago, he said they're not going to stifle the ICT growth in the same way. All right. So. I, I think the thing I want to challenge everyone with, both the communication companies as well as technology companies, is for us to work together in terms of that. But the communication companies uh, need to also potentially look at how they can make connectivity more affordable. It's one thing for the devices to be affordable, for the governments not to tax it, but there needs to be specific segments of connectivity 
to address the affordability aspects for a lot of them. So I'd like to hear what the telecommunication companies have to say. Okay, I probably can only take two more so we can answer the questions in the time we have left. Please get a mic to these people at the front here. There's several of them have been trying to get a question in. I have in a mic. <laughs> This way. Where's the phone? <laughs> okay, you win. You're second last. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Catherine Northing, and I'm the representative of the Organization for Migration here in Rwanda. And I have a question about um, people on the move. One in seven, in uh, one in seven people in the world are migrants, and there's a lot of push for um, the economic um, communities here in Africa for for supporting the development. So. My, in terms of governments and the technology companies, what is being done to encourage um, the reduction of costs for access to Wi-Fi when you are not in your home country and also for the, the mobile phone companies for also access? Um, we all, uh, I know, must have problems with roaming um, okay. and that's always not the same um, support as you have in your own country. Thank all right, you. and finally, we're gonna have a question. Yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, I'm Rebecca Okwachi. The Minister of Telecommunications, Postal Services, Republic of South Sudan. I'm a player, so I shouldn't have really been asking because the opportunities for the audience and being a policymaker. But given the situation of my country, I think it's good to share in what we have. I'll give a quick comment and then maybe I throw one to uh, Professor Murenzi just to give his uh, thoughts on that. Okay, real quick, Minister. Uh, very please. quickly, one is just to appreciate bringing in the issue of the female and uh, finding some of us very few in that game, I think it's calls for us in Africa to encourage women <laughs> to reach that level of policy making because that's how we make influence. Number two is the issue of the digital literacy. And, I would, and I'm happy that my colleague uh, JP brought it up. I throw it to uh, Professor Morenzi, especially with regards to digital literacy, advocacy and education, but much more the issues of our cultures and how they influence giving opportunities to all of us, including female in particular. So if you could throw some light on the issue of digital literacy and advocacy, right. and much more with regards to uh, female. Thank you. All right, many thanks, Minister Rebecca. We're gonna have to leave it there for the questions. We have just under eight minutes to have the audience, um, the panelists answer this. Everybody quick fire answers <laughs> real quick. Do you wanna start with the female on the panel? I don't think I should answer the female question. I'll let you answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me take the easy one in, in terms of, uh, I think there was a question about the pricing around data. Yes. We look very closely in terms of benchmarks around the world. And let me reassure you that not only does Africa have cheaper pricing than Western Europe, uh, US, but also across Asia. If you compare it to places like India, Philippines, Indonesia, African countries typically have lower pricing than the, all of those markets. Okay. So we're quite comfortable, we're in the right place. The gentleman from India said because of the, um, the connectivity, people like you're giving us, we've forgotten how to communicate. We're always looking at our phones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can have a comment on that. Yes. You know, I think these phones and these gadgets give us the ability to get access to an augmented reality. You know, sometimes this uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, looking at their, they're chatting, yes. they're talking to each other actually. But then they are sending jokes, they are sending pictures, videos. You know, the communication can be enriched. But I'm not, I'm not uh, downplaying the seriousness of this issue. So I've seen some innovations around the world. People saying, drop your phone in this basket and you get 10% off on all drinks. Yes. So that the human interaction can be enriched. Or there is no Wi-Fi here, talk to each other. My colleague, uh, Minister of Justice, is not here, but I wouldn't think he'll be thinking about a law to prevent people from using their gadgets wherever they, wa they want to use them. So we need to find these innovative mechanisms to start reversing the digital addiction. My next quick comment is going to go on... Um, VAT on devices, do you want to take that on the place of coaching My colleague, Minister of Finance, is here. Maybe he could have a comment. There is a health question. My colleague, Minister of Health, is here. Okay. Maybe she can make a, 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 quick, co a quick comment. Uh, the digital innovation, uh, there was a question on what are we doing as a government to encourage uh, these uh, young people to believe in themselves, to, to build and mature the innovation ecosystems. I think I can just give two examples and invite you to visit one of the uh, uh, centers we've put together for that, uh, K-Lab. I think one of the things the young people need is a space 
where they can meet among themselves, where they can meet the mentors. There is a huge amount of uh, um, goodwill from those who have who've made it in the market to come and share, but they need a place to meet. So such places are being put in place in Rwanda and across Africa. They are known as innovation hubs or innovation labs. Uh, and, and the amount of those labs are, is, is growing, and we just need to make sure that they operate very well and, and they are coordinated, and uh, that's uh, what we are doing at uh, uh, policy level. Finally, the best part needs to come at the end. It's about women. The Minister of Gender and Family is here in the room also. Uh, I'm sure she's burning to say something, but probably time it doesn't allow. But when you talk about women issues, it's better they are talked about by men, and that's called she, he for she. Okay. So this is what we're going to do because we're down to about five minutes before the end. I want to start from the end. Frederick, if you just want to give your final comments, where do we move from here? And if there are any questions that came up that you also want to handle in that time. Well, I, I think a couple of things. I mean, around the digital edition, first of all, I think we did studies on this. And, and you're right. There is only one point during the day, and this is very global, where people, where only 25% of people use a smartphone, and that is uh, tragically enough during dinner. So... I mean, it is an issue to a certain extent, but I think, to be honest, I think the benefits far outweigh the, these uh, liabilities. So uh, I, I, I think you need to set rules in the family like I tend to do with my uh, young ones that, you know, there's certain times you can use it, certain times you can't use it. Uh, I think on the question on VAT, and that's, uh, you know, I, I think, again, uh, you know, the industry needs to understand what it takes uh, to connect the next billion. I can only speak for ourselves what it means in terms of the business model we talked about sharing before. I think that's an excellent example in rural areas. Uh, I think for us to build more cost-efficient uh, cost efficient type of solutions is another area. So, so I think there's lots of things we can do if we collaborate around that. Okay, Professor Morenzi, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I spoke on the issue of um, uh, uh, skills, but I would like to comment one issue that I didn't come about is the issue of privacy. As all these young people are going to the internet, the issue of uh, data protection is very important. So it will be very important to, to have across Africa and the developing world in general, data protection laws. Europe has already that, in, in the US they have, and some countries are doing that, but it's very important. Of course, the issue of cyber security. Uh, we, we spoke about the issue of somebody who said that because there are crimes, because people are doing this and that, probably should stop using the social media. No. If you put the right, the right regulation, the right laws, in particular, data protection laws are very, are very important. Because when you go on the internet, you give yourself. You give yourself, you, 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 you are Morenz, you go there, you put your brain into there, and somebody will know, can hear it, try to know who you are, what you think. Because through data, it is possible to know your pattern your pattern of thinking. So it's, it's, it's very important. So w when you put your, uh, your, your, your email into Yahoo or uh, Gmail, and you, you, you put it there, you're putting your, your own there. Okay. So how do you protect that? So in going through s Transformation Africa, it will be important to take into account that. And that also will have an impact on the issue of culture that was discussed uh, 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 earlier. And the issues of uh, child, uh, child porno pornography. If you want more girls to go so on the internet, it is very, very important to be able to do that. The, um, the Broadband Commission just produced a report on, uh, on pornography, uh, and, you know, girls and whatever. So that, that report was very, very important. So it's very important to be able to, to, to think about that. I we want more people to go on the internet. We want more women, more young people. We need to be able to protect them. Okay. I'm going to skip Honorable JP and uh, come to Cynthia first for her closing comments a lot about Pan-Africa issues, so maybe to bring it home to Rwanda, and specifically Tigo Rwanda, we believe very much in innovation. We were the first to launch the 3G network in Rwanda. We were the first to offer Wi-Fi on public transport. We were the first to innovate with new distribution models to get more people using mobile money. And later this morning, we've got a very final and exciting announcement about our next steps in terms of innovation. So watch this space. All right, she won't tell us what exactly. We'll have to just wait Not and yet. Tarek. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so look, I think we are at a very exciting time. 
if you look at where we were five years ago and 10 years ago, and imagine where we're gonna be five years from now and 10 years from now, I think it's very exciting. I think we're seeing digital payments, you know, replacing cash completely, uh, consumers shopping online, I think e-commerce is gonna take off in a big way, uh, students using personalized learning and the content, uh, and you know, we are not talking about 20 year vision, we are talking things happening uh, over the next few years. Uh, I think to get there and to get to the challenge of next billion and the last billion, you know, thanks to the challenge from the minister, uh, I think we do need to work much closer between public and private sector, you know, much more of public-private partnerships, uh, you know, that will help us develop, you know, the right ICT skills that we need. Uh, also, I think here, part of this is just making the right connections. I think private sector will do based, what they'll do based on demand. Uh, and they critically need the skills to deliver what they need to deliver. So if you can just think of smart partnerships with universities, developing the skills that are needed, I think it's actually gonna come, come naturally. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And finally, Honorable Nsengi Mana, you want to close us out. Thank you so much. Um, let me first comment on the question on, on, on people on the move and their uh, ability to remain connected. I think it's, um, it's a very important question. Uh, in Rwanda, President Paul Kagame has directed, has advised that um, connectivity, access to broadband should be considered.
but hopefully the oh, oh there we are it was just waiting for me to announce the end of the session for its comeback honorable sangimana real quick thank you so much so we, we are working at least to put um, free wi-fi in every moving car in every public transport car we even cabinet recently as part of the revision of transport uh, fee included something to support and to sustain that basic right of uh, having people remaining connected on the move. But when you visit a government office, you vi visit a, a school, a restaurant, a hotel, you, should, you shouldn't be asking questions on whether you access because it's a fundamental utility just like this bottle of water or this light that we've been looking for. Secondly, to close, um, the VAT, I skipped that question, but I think my colleague won't have time. We are very conscious on, on, on how tax policy can um, imp have an implication on, on penetration. For that reason, Rwanda actually requested and obtained a stay of application on that law. That's why our penetration is still growing very much. And that's why we are also able to attract uh, new businesses like computer assemblies and, and so on, so that finally we can start looking at this electronics made in Africa. I think it's a challenge that I give to you to discuss. It's possible. We have the demand and we have the ability to do it. Lastly, nobody talked about the money challenge as if we, there is plenty of money as, as we connect the last billion. But I think we, we are focusing on the right questions because money will not be a problem where there are